For those of you wondering what this presentation is, is about, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I'm going to talk about the science behind dog training. Again, I am a science-based dog, tra dog trainer. You will not hear me talk about dominance. You will not hear me talk about being a pack leader. Why? Because it's all psychobabble. It means nothing. It's debunked. It's been disproven time and time and time again. Instead, you will hear me talk a lot about classical conditioning, operant conditioning, learning theory, differential reinforcement, counter conditioning, systematic desensitization. That's what all my training involves. And you can find that in any, in any book, any science book, which discusses, discusses behavior. I want to um, relate to you why dogs do what they do, mistakes that owners make, talk a little bit about operant conditioning, talk a little bit about classical conditioning, counter conditioning, and systematic desensitization. I'm gonna leave enough, uh, enough room in there to uh, throw it open, to throw the floor open to questions. And as Julia said, uh, we'll be taking questions from the chat window as well. So a little bit about me, I am a social worker. I'm a professional social worker. I have degrees, so I have a BA, a BSW, and an MSW. I'm also a registered social worker with the Newfoundland Labrador College of Social Workers. I got into dog training 16 years ago now. Um, people ask me, so what does social work have to do with dog training? And I would say, say to people, look, when it comes to social work, uh, we're heavily, heavily, heavily uh, educated in, in psychology. I used to go into people's homes during the day and write up behavior modification plans for the kids, uh, leave people's home in the evening, take that same behavior modification plan, cross out kid, put in dog, and you pretty much got the same thing. Uh, classical and operant conditioning, learning theory, applied behavioral analysis, that has that's been my bread and butter. So it wasn't hard to relate it to dogs. As a matter of fact, I, ha I recently had this argument with another trainer. He said, I'm about dog cognition, not people, not, not people, uh, not people psychology. I, I believe in dog cognition. I'm like, dude, it's the same thing. He said, no, it's not. I'm like, look, when you're talking about, um, things like, uh, classical conditioning, you know, um, you're, you're talking about Pavlov's dog. Dogs. Pavlov developed his theory by studying animals. B.S. B. Skinner. He studied uh, pigeons, rats, and that's where he developed his theory. When you're looking at the other classics like Piaget, seagulls, and they they took those theories and moved them to the human to the human worldview. Um, I'm just doing doing the same thing. Um, 16 years ago when I got into dog training, the dog will look really different. Dogs have become such a huge part of our lives now. And what's accepted, what was accepted 16 years ago is not what's accepted now. And, and you know, th things, will, things will keep developing like that. I run three core aspects of my program. So I run one-on-one -on -one behavioral consults. Uh, that's when I go, where I go into people's homes and I help them out with uh, behavior modification with their dog. I run group classes. I have a very extensive, as a matter of fact, I'm proud to say, I probably have the most extensive uh, dog training program in, in the province. Uh, so I run group classes and I also do a lot of volunteer work. So I'm the provincial evaluator trainer for the St. John Reynolds Therapy Dog program. Uh, I do a lot of presentations and into schools, community groups. Some of the people online here tonight actually help and bring, bring their dogs with it. Um, back just before COVID hit, I was asked to fly to Iqaluit to do to train in their staff up there and work with some of their dogs. And I've got a whole blog related to that. And some of you have seen the, the videos and the pictures from that. So I do a lot of volunteer work. All of that comes together to form Ken Reed Newfoundland's Dog Whisper Dog Training Program. So first off, I'd like to just cover a, a few things. So dog training, the dog training world has, has evolved. If you go back to the 1960s, 1970s, there, there's a gentleman called Stanley Kohler, and he believed in the whole yank and crank and method. Basically, um, the more dominant you were, the, the more you physically manipulated your dog, your dog would, res would respond to that. Fortunately, it kind of moved beyond that. But that kind of mentality side, a little bit of research with Caesar Milan. Now, Caesar Milan believes in pack theory and dominance theory, 
that has been debunked. It's been disproven. If you don't believe it, um, I, wa I want you to, uh, to, to do some research on it, Google it. It's been completely debunked. And while he's made a, a good living off that, um, most of what he said is absolute false. It just doesn't stand up to, uh, doesn't stand up to questioning. Um, then in the last decade or so, uh, a guy called Dr. Ian Dunbar, he is a vet. He's got his PhD in biochemistry, if I'm not mistaken, and he founded Serious Dog Training. Um, he believes in positive reinforcement, science-based training. Um, I'm very much a student of his. I, I've read everything that I could get my hands on when it comes to him. I've done courses from him, and uh, a lot of the what he says is reflected in, or I, I reflect a lot of, a lot of what he says. So. I'm going to skip that slide in the in the interest of of time, but I was going to ask you things that make go home, hmm, and I was going to throw it open and ask people um, what are some training advice that you think might be circumspect. Instead, what I'm going to do, rather than throw it open, because that that's a whole discussion in and of itself, I'm just going to advise you. Look, um, no, there's there's probably well, there's a, there's one other uh, field of study which contains so much information out there. And again, I told you I come from a social work background. Well, when you look at, when you look into how to raise your child, the, the information out there, there's reams of information out there. But just because there's reams of information out there doesn't mean it's good information. Well, the dog world kind of reflects that. Um, so I don't blame owners. I don't blame people for being confused and going down the wrong paths. As a matter of fact, I'll put up this slide. There's so much misinformation that exists out there that it's hard to discern what is good information and what is bad information. And I grabbed this one for one of the courses that I taught. This is seven ways to discipline your dog from, from a book called How to, Raise your Pup, How to Raise a Puppy You Can Live With. And they talk about things like pushing the puppy over quickly, either on the side or his back and lean over and this reinforces that you are dominant. Again, that's debunked science. There's no reason for it, and it'll actually get you in trouble. Scruff shake, grab the fur under the ear and neck and shake. A brief but brisk shake. This works best if you catch them in the act, and scruff shake is a surprise. Again, don't do that. Anyway, it go, goes on. This is a book that was written. It's published. Uh, it's in its, actually in its, in its fourth printing now, and it was published in 2005. And it's described on Amazon as the Bible of, of dog training. Um, I actually picked up the book rather than just going through the uh, going through the, the text and the highlights. I actually picked up the book and read it, and I can honestly say that three quarters of the book is absolute hogwash. But how are people supposed to know what's good information and what's not? The advice that I always give to people is if the information that you're reading is actually science-based. And again, when I say science-based, it talks about learning theory, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, counter conditioning, systematic desensitization, differential re reinforcement. If it talks about those terms, nine chances out of 10, you're reading some good stuff. If it talks about being an alpha, being a pack leader, being dominant, um, forget about it. It's, it's psychobabble, it means nothing, and it can actually get yourself in trouble. And I say that coming from the perspective of when I started off training, I was very much training in, in that mode. And some of you have trained under me and you've heard me mention those, those things. But fortunately I've learned, I've revised and I, I've gotten along with the times. Um, so why do dogs do what they do? I read a quote there the other day that says, um, you know, because they're dogs. So if you have a dog and it barks, the barking could be out of excitement, it could be out of fear, it could be from separation anxiety, it could be from boredom, it could be from wanting attention. But most likely it's because they're dogs. So dogs do what they do for a variety of, of reasons. However, when you look at the reasons why dogs do what they do, it's still governed by behavioral science. Like any sentient being, if you go at, if you go at it from a, from a behavioral science perspective, uh, you can influence, you can shape, and you can modify dogs' behavior. Sometimes it takes time to do that. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of know-how. But it's amazing what we can get our dogs to do. And it's up to us humans to open up those lines of communication. We as humans, and you, some of you have heard me say this in class, we as humans, if our dog isn't doing what we want, we believe that all we got to do is say it a bit louder. So you get, Fido, come, come, come here, get your ass over here. 
look, if your dog isn't doing it the first or second time you said it, it's either A, because they don't know what you're talking about, or B, you've made it completely unfun fun. There's no motivation for them to do it. So I keep that in mind. Um, okay. So it's up to us to open up those lines of communication. We, dogs don't speak human. We don't speak dog. We have been born with the gift of complex thinking. So it's up to us to open up those lines of communication with our dogs. So when it comes to dog behavior, behavior can be classified into two categories. You got voluntary and involuntary behaviors. When I talk about voluntary behaviors, I'm talking about things like sit down, stand, stay, come, pop, roll over, bark, shut up. Um, they're behaviors that a dog has learned and they've learned them, they serve a purpose. Now, one of the first things I want you to keep in mind is when it comes to vo those voluntary behaviors, shaping those behaviors and modifying those behaviors, as long as the dog is getting what they want from doing the behavior, as long as the behavior is being reinforced, the dog is gonna continue to do it. So it's up to you as an owner to make sure the behaviors that you like work for the dog. The behaviors that you don't like don't work for the dog. If they don't work for the dog any longer, the behavior will start to become extinct. It will start to fade and then become extinct. So on one side of the equation, you got that, those voluntary behaviors. Again, they're learned. On the other side of the equation, though, you have involuntary behaviors, and this is where people really screw up. When I talk about involuntary behaviors, I'm talking about behaviors that are emotional-based. And normally when I talk about emotional-based emotional, emotional -based behaviors, I'm talking about behaviors that come from the FAS spectrum, the fear, anxiety, and stress. Those are barking, lunging, growling, snapping, crying, hiding. They're, uh, they're, an, they're an instinctual response from the dog. So if you look at your dog's behaviors and try to see which category they fall in, then uh, you, you can easily see what path you should take in shaping or modifying those behaviors. So voluntary behaviors are governed by operant conditioning. Now, when I say operant conditioning, a lot of us have heard of the term before. Operant conditioning is just use of rewards and punishers in order to increase the likelihood of behavior happening again or to decrease it. So the more you reward a behavior that you like, the more that the dog will repeat that behavior. Now, when I say, when I say rewards, people automatically think about food, treats, toys, praise, any and all of the above. They're all great reinforcers. Where I challenge my students is to look at by all means, look at those rewards, but then look at why is my dog doing this behavior? What, what purpose does it serve? If you're giving into that purpose, if you're allowing the dog, that purpose of that behavior to be served, well, then you're naturally rewarding the dog. So if the dog comes over, sits in front of me and looks at me for attention, and I give him attention, that's a re reward. Now, I can make that attention a super reward by including food, treats, toys, any and all of the above in with the attention, but ultimately the, the reward is the attention that I'm giving the dog. Now, if I don't like that behavior, the punishment is a withdraw the attention. The dog doesn't get the attention. That is the punisher. When I talk about punishers, people automatically think about yelling, screaming, bawling, no, knock it off, give it up, stop. While those are punishers, most times they're not very effective punishers. When I say punishers, I mean a withdraw of something. So in the case that we're just describing, say if a dog is jumping on you, well, they're jumping on you for attention. Your punishment, your punishment will be withdraw the attention. If you say no, knock it off, give it up, stop, you're talking to your dog, which means you're giving your dog attention, which means you're, absolute, you're actually reinforcing behavior. So if you want to stop the jumping, ignore the dog. If you want to increase the jumping, by all means, pay attention to the dog. And that's what, that's what a lot of people do. So keep that in mind. Just because, I, just because operant conditioning means punishers, punishment doesn't have to be painful. It doesn't have to, to be something that the dog hates. It just means you're withdrawing what the dog wants. If you're consistently doing, if you're consistently rewarding the behaviors that you desire, and punishing by withdrawing what the dog wants, the behaviors that you don't that you don't like, the dog will quickly learn what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So that's operant conditioning in a nutshell. Involuntary behaviors, so those that are emotionally based, are governed by classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is just it involves getting a dog to develop a positive association 
with a neutral or negative stimulus by getting them to associate that neutral or negative stimulus with a positive thing. It basically means whenever the dog encounters something that they don't like, good things happen. If good things happen, every time the dog encounters something that he doesn't like, he starts really liking the things that he doesn't like. If he starts liking it, the behavior itself, the, the negative behavior, is going to decrease. Oftentimes, classical conditioning involves counter-conditioning and systematic desensitization, which means you, you're systematically exposing your, dogs to, your dog to things that he doesn't like. Now the, the, and then slowly, you're amping up the intensity of that exposure. The biggest mistake people make with counter-conditioning systematic desensitization is they push it too far too fast, you know, and that's a huge mistake. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, again, this, this uh, presentation is not meant to delve into this really deeply. If you guys got questions on this, you can ask me after or contact me and, and I can explain more. But that, that's, the, that's the whole classical conditioning in a nutshell. I thought what I would do... Oh, so the, when it comes to uh, addressing issues with behavior shaping, behavior modification, classical and operant conditioning, the differences between them. An operant conditioning, an example of operant conditioning behavior would be a dog barking when it's time for, for food. They bark, they bark, they look at the food bowl, the owner gives them the food. So that barking and looking at the food bowl, that's going to increase as the owner, as the owner uh, gives into the behavior, i.e. gets food for the dog. If the owner didn't like that barking, well, then don't give him the food bowl. <laughs> the dog will switch to something else. If the owner liked that, then the owner will give the dog food, and that behavior will continue. If the owner didn't like that, well, don't give him the food. And eventually, the dog will switch to something else. That's, uh, that's a good example of operant conditioning. Classical, an example of classical conditioning would be, from the dog's perspective, I hear the cu cupboard door open. I'm going to get a treat. He associates the opening of the cupboard door or the sound of the door opening with the treat. That's classical conditioning. Okay, so addressing people. I, I wanted to take a couple solid examples because operant conditioning and classical conditioning, it's very easy to confuse the two. And admittedly, there are some gray areas in there where they, where they, kind of, where they can cross over. But a really common problem that people face is, again, a dog jumping on them. Well, in order to address using operant conditioning, first you have to ask, okay, why is the dog jumping on me? So you need to realize the dog is jumping on you in order to get attention. You need to realize that any attention that you give the dog when the dog is jumping, whether the attention is positive is in, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, which the dog gets right from a puppy, or whether it's negative is in, darn dog, get off me. It's immaterial. You're still giving the dog attention. So if jumping results in the dog being immediately ignored, then the jumping is going to decrease and the dog's going to switch to something else. If the jumping results in immediate attention, well, the jumping is going to continue. If four paws on the floor results in immediate attention being given, the dog is going to start keeping four paws on the floor. Now, again, adding in a little bit of desensitization and practicing, if you're practicing low distraction environments and low intensity situations and gradually stamp, start amping it up to higher levels, then you, the, dog will, the dog will comply more and more. The dog will learn. Four paws on the floor means attention. Four paws out, the, if my paws come off the floor, I get immediately ignored. So then you got, just got to start pra practicing that. And that's where a lot of people downfall. They just don't proof their dog correctly. I also wanted to take an example of using classical conditioning and ad addressing fear, fear of another dog. So it, you got to understand if your dog is growling, snapping, lunging at, a, at other dogs, the response is it's a fear based response. So the first thing you got to realize is that you can't punish that out of your dog. As a matter of fact, I always use the example. Think of yourself and think of yourself not liking spiders. So you come to me and say, Ken, I'm scared of spiders. I say, how scared are you? are you? And you say, well, whenever I see a spider crawling up the wall, I scream. I say, no problem. We'll handle that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow you around all day, every day. Whenever you see a spider start screaming, I'm going to punch you in the face. Now, I'm being facetious in that. But obviously, if I do that often enough, if I'm doing it consistently enough, punching you in the face, it's going to stop screaming eventually. But it's going to leave you more fearful of spiders than ever. And that fear has got to come out in some way, shape, or form. 
So just imagine the damage we're doing to our dog when a dog lunges at another dog or a dog growls at another dog. You say, hey, knock that off. Give it up. Stop and yank up on that leash. The growls, the growling may stop, but your dog is going to hate that other dog. And that, that, that emotion's got to come out in some way, shape, or form. So in order to address that, what I'm suggesting you do, realize the dog is growling out of fear. Realize that punishment of any kind is not going to work. As a matter of fact, it, it'll serve on masking the issue. And then engage in classical conditioning, counter conditioning, systematic desensitization. So what you do is every time your dog sees, hears, smells another dog, good things happen. Regardless of how, so this is the big jump that I'm asking you to make, regardless of how the dog is reacting. So yes, even if your dog growls on another dog, you rain good things down on them. Now people say to me, wait now, Ken, you're telling me to reward my dog for growling on another dog? Nope, that's not what I'm saying. When it comes to classical conditioning, when it comes to treating behaviors on this end of the spectrum, you're not talking about rewards. If this was an optimal conditioning problem, if your dog was voluntarily growling at another dog because that's what you taught him to do, yes, providing him with a treat, that would be rewarding that behavior. On this end of the spectrum, you're dealing with an emotion. What you're trying to do is you're trying to convince your dog, look, I know you hate this other dog, but when this other dog comes around, good things rain down on you. If good things rain down on you, you're going to start tolerating and maybe even start liking the other dog. Once you start tolerating and liking the other dog, the barking, lunging, and growling is going to disappear. I want everybody to think about that. The next thing that you do is you engage in counter conditioning systematic desensitization, which means exposing your dog to other dogs. Take it nice and slow. Start off with really simple stuff. Bring other dogs' clothes into your home and allow your dog sniff and rain good things down on your dog whenever your dog sniffs at the clothes, whenever they pass the clothes. Play music for, or play, uh, play dog sounds for your dog throughout the day. Low volume to high volume, short durations to long durations, and rain good things down when your dog hears another dog to over speaker, barking, panting, whining, growling, whatever. And you're playing it, and you're looking before you amp up the intensity of, the, of the, that exposure, you're looking for a positive response from your dog. So when you play, say, the sound of a dog barking, if your dog is looking at you wagging his tail, now you know, okay, I can amp it to the next level. If you gradually amp up the intensity exposure, slowly expose your dog to other dogs, sight, sound, and smell, the graduation exercise will be you walking your dog past the dog that he doesn't like and, the, and your dog looking at you and wagging his tail because you've de he's developed that association. That is classical conditioning in a nutshell. So some common mistakes people make in using optimal conditioning. They engage in poor and improper punishers, i.e. yank and cranking. Thinking no is a magical word is a huge one. Deal with that in class all the time. I wish we would give up saying no to our dog. Now there is a time and place to say that, but we overuse it. Unwittling, unwittingly reinforcing undesirable behaviors. Lack of practice or overpractice, so poor proofing, a practicing in environments of too high distraction, believing training collars are solutions to problem. I actually had a conversation with with somebody that I met on trail the other day, and they were they were saying, "Oh my, your puppy is walking so well. How do I do that? Practice walking the dog." Yeah, but what what are you doing? I'm I'm walking my dog. But what collar are you using? Flat buckle collar. No, you must be doing something else. I'm walking my dog. <laughs> practice, proper practice, proper techniques outweighs anything else that you can do with your dog. Some common mis So, story time. The really beat this home. I like telling the story of Lexi and Lucy. Now, I've, I've changed some of the names here, guys, to keep things confidential and private. Okay, story of Lexi and Lucy. They're two West Highland terriers who love watching Coronation Street. Now, the problem with the, the, with the dogs watching Coronation Street is that the dog's owners, who also love watching Coronation Street, any time the opening of Coronation Street would come on when the credits would roll, eventually a cat would walk across the screen and meow. And Lexi and Lucy would go nuts! So it meant that their owners, when they, when they did the Coronation Street marathon at the end of every week, were, were left very frustrated. So they asked me to help out. So. We looked at the problem and said, okay, Lexi and Lucy are barking at this cat that comes across the screen and they're really excited to see this cat. So this is something that they wanted. So using operant conditioning, I worked with the owners and we said, okay, if 
them seeing the cat is something that they really like. Let's make them seeing this cat conditional on them controlling their emotions. So we simply started off by having a cat paused on the screen and rewarding Lexi and Lucy for being quiet. And then we started with the cat walking slowly across the screen. We were able to control the speed of the cat. And again, rewarding for Lexi and Lucy being calm. And then we turned off the picture, but we started playing the meow. Low volumes to high volumes, short durations to long durations. And rewarding Lexi and Lucy for being quiet. And then we started combining the both of them together. It took about an hour to do this, but at the end of the hour, Lexi and Lucy were sitting on the couch and wagging the tail because no one watching this watching the credits roll, no one the cat was coming, and no one we weren't going to pause it or we weren't going to mute the volume as long as they stayed quiet. And it worked like a charm. The owners, after a couple weeks of practice of this, wrote me a, an email saying, thank you, we can now watch Coronation Street anytime we want, Lexi and Lucy are being quiet. So that's an example of operant conditioning and also bringing in some, uh, some counter conditioning and, and systematic desensitization. So some common mistakes owners make with classical conditioning. Well, they confuse classical and operant conditioning. I have people all the time say to me, okay, Ken, so yeah, when I see a dog out on trail, my dog reacts to other dogs. So I get them to, I get, I back them off from the trail, I get them to sit, and if they don't bark, I give them, I give them uh, rewards. See, I'm, I'm using positive reinforcement. No, you're absolutely confusing classical and operant conditioning. That's not gonna work. Having unrealistic expectations, engaging in punishment when dealing with those involuntary, uh, those involuntary behaviors, inconsistent uh, provision of good stuff. You, got to, you can't overdo classical conditioning and pushing things too far too fast. Those are some of the common mistakes people make. Story time, case of Hunter. So I was in a Calouette uh, just, before, uh, just before COVID hit. Uh, I work with a bunch of the dogs up there. So one dog in particular, his name is Hunter. He was a sled dog that uh, was abandoned in the community. He spent about three weeks running through the community. He bit a number of people. He was very, very aggressive. Um, none of his staff could work with him. There was one volunteer staff member who's 15 years old. And he used to have to, before he went to school in the morning, he'd have to go to the shelter, get Hunter from inside the shelter out, to, out into the run, come back after school, uh, feed Hunter, then come back in the evening, walk Hunter and get Hunter from outside to inside again. And Hunter was like a baby to him. He could do anything he wanted with Hunter, but nobody else could even approach him. So I'll never forget the first day that I arrived at the shelter. Um, the young fella brought Hunter out of his shelter and Hunter, uh, Hunter lunged and dragged the young fella across the lot. And it wasn't a good scene. Hunter wanted to, wanted to eat me. So I left and picked up a rotisserie chicken. Ran, came back to the shelter, grabbed the shelter, the director's shelter and the senior shelter uh, manager there and uh, went out to start working with Hunter. And uh, so I started to approach his run and Hunter attacked the side of the run. He wanted nothing to do with me. So I backed off as far as I could, sat down, peeled off, started peeling off pieces of chicken and passing it to Hunter. And Hunter was snapping it at the air. Now he'd go right back to growling and attacking the, the side of the kennel, but he was accepting it. And I remember the, the shelter manager saying to me, Ken, he's gonna eat you. You're rewarding him for growling at you. And I say, no. What I'm trying to do, I respect that he's grown at me. I respect that he doesn't like me. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to convince him to like me by providing him with this chicken. Over three days, this is what I did. And over three days, I started getting closer and closer. By the end of the second day, um, I was actually able to feed Hunter from my hand. By the morning, of the, by the third morning, I walked into, walked into the runs and Hunter was sitting there wagging his tail and whining. Halfway through the morning, he was running for the, the door, whining, and then running back and jumping up on top of his dog house. I only had a week there, less than a week, five days. So I really pushed this. So I grabbed the shelter manager and I said, look, I'm going to jump in. If he starts attacking me, uh, you know, get help. Anyway, I jumped in. He ran over and jumped up on top of his house. And I went over and sat down uh, on top of his house. And he jumped into my lap and started kissing me. I've actually got a video of 
of this in, in real time. And from then on, I could do whatever I wanted with them. I immediately took him in, gave him a bath, trimmed his nails, brushed him. And for the next uh, three days that I was there, he was my constant companion. Then it was a matter of me saying, getting some of the other staff to do the exact same thing. Now, just imagine if I went in there and said, okay, Hunter, you're growling at me. I'm going to jump on you. I'm going to pin you down. I'm going to make you submit to me. And then we can get on with the work. Hunter was a 120 pound dog. Hunter would have eaten me. Instead, I said, okay, I know you don't like me. Let's focus on getting you to like me. Once I did that, then everything else kind of fell into place. That's classical conditioning. That's the power of classical conditioning, counter conditioning, systematic desensitization. So I want to leave 15, 20 minutes for questions. So in this presentation, I reviewed the dog training paradigms, different dog training paradigms, the difference between voluntary and involuntary behaviors, operant and classical conditioning, and when to use each using some practical, practical examples. I realize this talk, it's just scratching the surface of behavior shaping, behavior modification. Um, it's not meant to replace uh, consultations with a professional such, a, such as myself, but it gives you, hopefully what I, my, my goal of in this presentation is to give you an overview of what's out there and where, where you should look. True behavior shaping, true behavior modification, it takes time and it takes effort. Sometimes the slightest thing that you're doing could mean the difference between success and lack of success. And that's where some of the, some of the, the work that I do co comes in. If you guys want to contact me in any way, shape, or form, here's a list of ways to contact me. I'm very available. Um, I always tell people, if I don't get back to you within 24, 48 hours, try to contact me in a different way because sometimes I, it, things really blow up blow up for me. Generally though, if you phone me, uh, I, I get back to you within, within a couple of hours. These are different ways to contact me. I also have a website, www.nldogwhisper.com. Uh, it contains all kinds of information. One of the sections on my website is Ken's blog. If you go to that, I've got all kinds of articles written on, on this and other stuff over the years. It's a, it's a great resource for you. I've also got a YouTube channel, NL Douglas, for if you look it up, I've got um, videos up there. I do 60 second tips, usually they last a couple minutes anyway, and where I talk about this stuff. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to draw your attention to is my Facebook group called Ken Reads for the Love of Dogs. Join up. One of the things we do is we meet every weekend and we walk our dogs together. Six to 60 plus dogs, teacup chihuahuas to Great Danes. Uh, the walks are free. The only thing I do is I hold up my poop bag at the start of each walk. People toss in a toonie to a $5 bill and that goes to charity. Great way to get your dogs out there and everybody's welcome as long as you obey the rules of walking that's posted. So we do that every week. So come on out and you can reach out to me in, in any one of these ways. Mm -hmm.